Hi there! As far as we know today, humanity is the only intelligent species there is. And while astronomers keep searching for extraterrestrials, it got me thinking, what if some other sentient life form were right here on Earth? What would they be and what would it mean for us? Think about it. Even if we find some other civilization among the stars, how prepared would we be to meet another intelligent being that isn't human? It could become a problem for us. But if we were used to sharing our home with other non-human civilizations, we'd be much more equipped to engage in negotiations with aliens. Who knows? Maybe we'd have already found them by now if we were prepared for that encounter by learning from other beings here on Earth. And this possibility isn't as abstract as it seems. Several scenarios could lead us to share our planet with another sentient species. They could have evolved for millions of years alongside us. They might have come here from another place somewhere among the stars. It could even be that we already live with some kind of planetary-scale neighbors right now, but still don't fully understand them. But we'll return to this point a bit later. At the very least, we aren't the only sentient species that ever lived on the Earth. I'm not talking about prehistoric lizard people or any other pseudo-scientific nonsense here. I'm talking about Neanderthals. They look very much like us and were also ancestors of primates. Their brains were even bigger than ours, and they used tools and cooked food. They weren't as intelligent as humans, but they had a way of communicating with each other. Then, some 40,000 years ago, they all went extinct, leaving us alone to build the foundation for our future civilizations. It's a sad story that we all know, except it's not entirely true. In reality, we lived alongside this similarly developed species for around 5,000 years. There's evidence in some remains found in the territory of today's Europe that humans lived with Neanderthals. And it even worked out quite well, actually. It's not enough that our DNAs are around 99% similar. There were humans who lived with them and had shared offspring. And it wasn't some unique case, but a common occurrence. To this day, parts of the Neanderthals' DNA, around 1 or 2%, are sometimes found in human DNA. So, we have our answer. If Neanderthals lived with us and never went extinct, we probably wouldn't even notice them now. We'd already be assimilated with each other too well to even separate who's a Neanderthal and who's a Homo sapien. Other than that Neanderthal down the block who plays his music really loud at 3 a.m. Or, in another case, if neither of us were keen on interbreeding, they'd have evolved and developed into a separate civilization just like we did. To us, they'd just be some separate nation that lives by its own rules and with whom we'd have economic and political relationships. But if we were to find out that some other life form had evolved until now and has nothing in common with us at all, that would definitely be another deal. And our prime candidates are not primate at all. Some social monkey-like creatures, like chimpanzees or gorillas, are capable of using simple tools and communicating with each other. Yet they feel quite comfortable in their own place and aren't rushing to be alongside humans. Cats, dogs, and crows are intelligent, sure, but their wit is all about adapting to humans and not necessarily evolving into something separate. Dolphins, though, they're our closest rivals in the way of intelligence. First, we need to clarify what qualifies as an intellectually developed species. The one of many signs of intelligence in a life form is its ability to think abstractly. This ability is demonstrated in complex problem-solving tests, which will verify if the subject, like a crow or an octopus, can solve a task by going through several steps. One important thing here. If the solution includes using some kind of tool, this tool shouldn't be familiar to the test subject. For example, you can leave an octopus with a small hammer and a container with a treat inside. It'll take some time, but the octopus will figure out that it can lift the hammer and that it's heavy enough to break the container. The fact that the octopus had never seen a hammer before shouldn't deter it. So, the solution doesn't come from the experience, but from the ability to immediately find a use for a tool based on its qualities. In other terms, some species can learn things and collect knowledge just like we do. That's impressive, 
but not enough. Abstract thinking implies a complex social behavior, which allows a species to communicate, pass on newly obtained knowledge, and cooperate on solving a problem. And on that level, only dolphins and whales can truly shine. It's already been proved that dolphins and some toothed whales have a complex system of signals, which even include calling each other by names. Their intelligence is quite developed, but absolutely alien to ours. Their only limitation to interacting with the world around them is their body, especially their lack of hands. They can only innovate and experiment as much as their bodies will allow them. Considering all that, a hypothetical world where we share our home planet with an intelligent ocean species is looking pretty good. The ocean covers more than half of the Earth's surface, and we have no major claims on that territory since we're used to living on land. Maybe they'd provide us better ways of navigation and transoceanic transportation, or ensure our safety in the ocean. After all, dolphins are already known to accompany ships and save people from drowning. Even if, in all reality, it's more of a game for them than a real moral choice. Another possibility, yet quite outlandish, is that we, after all, will meet an extraterrestrial intelligent life. But what if, instead of an invasion or the start of some meaningful communication, we end up with space refugees? Imagine an alien spaceship coming to us in search of shelter and fuel. In this case, humanity would need to be extremely patient and tolerant. Not only because it's the most human thing to do, but also because the reward for it could be absolutely game-changing. Imagine how much they could tell and teach us. Interstellar travel is, in itself, something we have only a vague idea about. But it could bring us so much more – sources of energy, recycling, or even communication. After all, these aliens will probably be unfathomably different from us, but they'll certainly be social enough to show us more advanced science and engineering than ours. This means that we'll have a chance to establish some kind of relationship. They'll probably be different in a physiological way too. And that means they might be better off finding their shelter underwater, in deserts, on ice, or on the highest peaks of Earth's mountains. Their science might allow them to use something we have in abundance as a source of energy or food. So sharing a planet with another civilization wouldn't be a disaster if we don't prejudge and simply take our time to understand. Hmm, based on world history, good luck with that. And finally, here comes a little plot twist. We're already becoming an excellent training ground for developing stable relationships with a vastly different kind of intelligence. And we're the ones who are creating it. I'm talking about artificial intelligence, of course. In its basic form, we have a clear understanding of how AI works. But here's the reason about half of the scientific community is openly arguing against any further development of this technology. Today, we have complete control over its simple forms, but that's only until it obtains the ability to learn and develop itself. The challenge with AI is that it has no bodily limits. It doesn't need us as much as we would probably need it. It's a tough thing to have an equal and fair relationship with something like that. Yet, the AI that we have now is a good way to prepare ourselves and make the best of it in every possible way. You're gazing up at the night sky. Wow! For much of our history, we've been looking for life among these stars and the planets near them. But space has eyes too, and there's someone out there looking at us, maybe. Scientists claim that at least 29 distant planets may be watching us right now. So comb your hair and smile. We've so far identified at least 1,715 neighboring star systems in the Milky Way that can detect our planet with conventional telescopes. These stars are located in our galaxy. So if they were to point their telescopes at our Sun, sooner or later they would see a small dot that passes between our home star and the observer. This is called a transit. It's a method of detecting planets in astronomy. For example, you can observe transit phenomenon right at home with a telescope. You have to point it at the Sun and wait. Then you'll see Mercury. That's the closest planet to the Sun, and now you see it as a small dot. 
Mercury transit process can last about 5 hours. And this phenomenon happens about 14 times in a century. You'll be able to observe the next transit on November 13, 2032. Mark your calendar. Likewise, you can observe Venus, the second planet from the Sun. But because it's farther away, its transits are less frequent. The last one was in 2004 and 2012. The next pair of transits is expected in 2117 and 2125. Hey, I won't be around then. So these star systems have the opportunity to observe our planet. But long-range telescopes work a little differently. Actually, the observer will not see a black dot with the sun in the background. The telescope will measure the brightness of our star. When Earth begins its transit between the sun and the observer, the telescope will record a slight drop in the brightness of the star because our planet is blocking the path of the sun's rays. Those far-away scientists of extraterrestrial civilizations will be able to calculate this drop in brightness and determine the size of our planet. But not all 1,700-plus star systems may have extraterrestrial life. Scientists have narrowed it down to 29 planets near some of these stars. They're potentially habitable. That means these planets are roughly Earth-like in size and within the habitable zone of their host star. That means they're not too close to the star, so it's not too hot for a potential life. The water doesn't evaporate there like in a boiling pot. And they're not too far away, so it's not too cold and the water doesn't freeze into thick sheets of ice. And since water is the basis of life, we can assume that civilization might exist there. Theoretically, these planets could have seen Earth transits in the last 5,000 years. So, while we were building the Pyramids of Giza or Stonehenge, an extraterrestrial civilization may have been watching us. One of these planets is only 11 light years from our home. Near the Ross 128 star, a red dwarf in the constellation Virgo. There's an exoplanet about twice the size of Earth and right in the habitable zone of its host star. Theoretically, the inhabitants of this planet could see Earth transit the Sun on a regular basis for 2,000 years. But about 900 years ago, the planet lost its position and can no longer continue observation. The other planet where Earth can be seen transiting is 12.5 light years away, near the star called Tea Garden. The window for observing our planet will open there in about 29 years. We're betting heavily on the TRAPPIST-1 star system. It hosts at least seven exoplanets, almost like our solar system. And four of them are in the habitable zone of the star. But they won't be able to start observing Earth until 16 centuries from now. But we can try to make contact with these planets right now. They're all close enough to us to pick up our radio signals. Radio waves can travel through space at the speed of light, and our planet has been emitting radio signals continuously since 1895. So we're like noisy neighbors in the radio spectrum. If there's a planet somewhere with an intelligent civilization within 125 light years of us, our radio noise would have already reached them. The only problem is, it would take about the same time to get a response from that civilization. The other problem with radio is that any civilization uses it for a relatively short period. Even now on Earth, we use Bluetooth and fiber optics more than radio, except for maybe traffic reports. And over time, all the radio noise we create will simply disappear. Also, radio communication assumes that an extraterrestrial civilization is advanced enough to use this technology. But who knows? Maybe there are life forms in space that are really different from ours. Our radio signals already could have reached that planet, but its inhabitants simply aren't capable of receiving them. And the moment these life forms build antennas to receive the signal, we'll no longer emit them. But we don't lose hope, and we even send encrypted radio signals into space to communicate with extraterrestrial civilizations. In 1974, we sent the Arecibo message into interstellar space. If some civilization can decipher it, they'll get a rectangle like this. It has all the information about humanity. At the top is our number system. 
then the atomic numbers, and then our DNA, which is pictured below, then a human being itself, of course. Below is a diagram of our solar system. Earth, the third planet from the Sun, is slightly elevated. This is how the extraterrestrial civilization will understand which planet this message came from. Below is a diagram of the Arecibo radio telescope itself. Another option how to deliver a message to a distant planet is to literally send a mail delivery there. It could be a space probe. And we've already done that. These are Voyagers 1 and 2. They were launched in 1977 and are still operational. In 2012, Voyager 1 became the first-ever human-made object in interstellar space. It travels to distant stars and carries a message written on a golden record. The disk contains greetings in 55 Earth languages, a lot of music from different parts of our planet, different sounds like ocean noise, human voices and animal sounds. In addition, there are 116 images on the record. These are pictures of people and earthly landscapes. In these pictures, there's information about the sun and our DNA. The record case contains instructions and a needle to play the record. There's also a map of our galaxy's pulsars so that astronomers from an extraterrestrial civilization can find our solar system. The main disadvantage of sending a message this way is time. Voyager 1 will reach its first stop, the Gliese 445 star, in 40,000 years. Voyager 2 will reach the Ross 248 star in 42,000 years. And in about 296,000 years, it'll pass Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky. I can't wait. Also, an extraterrestrial civilization can detect us with calculations and formulas. All it takes is a little observation of the Sun. In star systems with planets, the host star doesn't stand still. It rotates around a small orbit. This is because the heavy star attracts the planet, but the planet also has its own gravity and resists. This shifts the star a little and causes it to orbit around. An extraterrestrial civilization can calculate this shift of the Sun and determine the mass of the planets near the star. Using such a method, astronomers were able to find 548 exoplanets. Now suppose we made contact with an extraterrestrial civilization near the closest star, Proxima Centauri. There's indeed an exoplanet there, but radiation from the host star would destroy any life forms. But imagine we still got a return signal. It would be the slowest chat in history, because our message would take 4.2 years to reach the planet, and we'd have to wait another 4.2 years to get a response. And so we arranged to meet. This civilization doesn't know how to fly into space. So we have to take the first step. Although Proxima Centauri is the closest star to our solar system, it takes about 73,000 years to travel there by conventional rocket. So we have to learn to travel at the speed of light. But even then, it would take 4.2 years to travel there. Imagine if we found extraterrestrial life on the other side of the Milky Way. Our galaxy is 100,000 light-years wide. So the journey from edge to edge would take 100 millennia. So, we either have to cheat the laws of physics or transfer all of human civilization to a giant spaceship that will travel from star to star for thousands of years. And when it launches from Earth, only the great 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 and many more greats of the first crew will be able to see another star system from the spaceship portal. Hey, can you move your head? I'm trying to see out the window. Dozens of spacecraft and hundreds of probes take off from Earth and head for our planet's twin sister, Venus. It's about the same size as the Earth and has around 80% of our planet's mass. The temperatures here are too high for humans, and it doesn't have the air we're used to breathing. But we went there because scientists recently found traces of phosphine gas, which suggests that life might be there. Phosphine comes from various microbes and bacteria, so humanity goes on this journey to discover this life. With our technology, a flight to Venus would take three and a half to six and a half months, but we finally made it. 
spaceships are landing on the planet, and when the first humans come to the surface, they see heat-scorched deserts, lava lakes, and geysers of poisonous acid. And that's it. Scientists miscalculated the radio telescope data. Phosphine never existed on Venus. So we're going back to the rockets, and we're getting ready for a longer trip across our galaxy. The scientists believe that there's at least 36 civilizations in the Milky Way that are similar to ours. They could be living organisms completely different from us. They may have different bodies, different eyes. They may walk and talk in a very different way than we do. But an advanced civilization has several criteria, technological progress, and the use of developed communication between individuals. So these civilizations must explore space, build cities, and be able to communicate with each other as independent species. Let's look at our galaxy and find these civilized worlds. So, the Milky Way is a spiral of 100,000 light years from side to side. If a star is born at one end of it in a super powerful blast, the light from that event won't even reach the other end until 100,000 years later. There's about 100 billion stars, and near each of them, there may be worlds similar to our solar system. Let's try to find these habitable worlds using giant seas. First, we look for stars that have a lot of iron. Such stars burn at the perfect temperature for the development of life. And the iron in the star system will help form the cores of planets that will be home to another civilization. We sift the Milky Way through our sieve. We see that there are too many stars that fit the description, so we need another filter. Now let's find stars that look like the sun in this pile. The star must be about 100 times larger than the Earth and 333,000 times heavier. An important criterion is the age of the star. When a star gets old, it begins to expand and turns into a red giant. At this time, it can absorb the planets around it. The life of such a star can end with a huge blast that destroys everything around it. So the star we're looking for must be relatively young. Let's use our sieve again. There's fewer stars, but still that's a lot. Now let's focus on the planets. They should be in the habitable zone of the star. Not too close to a star because then the temperature would be too high for life to be born and not too far away. Then the planet would just be an ice block with nothing living on it. The temperature of the planet must allow the water to remain liquid. Another filter is the age of the candidate planet. It takes time for an advanced civilization to develop. Based on the experience of Earth, scientists believe that it takes at least 4.5 billion years for any life form to evolve to the human level. So we're looking for planets similar to Earth or older. We use our sieve one last time, and voila, we have 36 worlds where an advanced civilization is possible. Scientists conducted this study and published it in April 2020, based on these very criteria. All that's left is to discover these civilizations and make the first contact. We can detect such a civilization by using radio waves that come from it. Suppose there's a planet A with primitive living organisms on it, millions of years of evolution, and they'll become a civilization with advanced technology. Radio waves will be the way they communicate. Then the whole planet will emit radio waves like a star emits light. And here on Earth, we'll be able to pick up this signal with antennas pointed into space. But there's a problem with the distance between the planets. For example, planet A is 1,000 light years away from the Earth. When planet A starts emitting radio waves, these signals won't reach us until 10 centuries later. We learned to emit and receive radio waves in 1895. And if the civilization on planet A emitted a radio signal at the same time, we won't be able to pick up that signal until 2895. It'll be the same on planet A. We sent a message in the form of a radio signal into space in 1974. In this signal, we encoded our number system, human DNA, and information about our solar system. If there's an advanced civilization on planet A, they'll be able to receive this signal only in 2974 and we'd have to wait another millennium to get a response from them. Another problem with radio waves is that they don't look like a constant glow on the planet, but like a flare. Radio waves are only used at a certain stage of civilization. At first, it's the primary method of communication, but then we begin to use cell phones, cable TV, and fiber optics. And as technology advances further, our radio wave light begins to fade out. So we only have about 100 years of active radio use by civilization to find it. One day, we caught a strange radio signal of an unknown origin. Its characteristics suggested that the signal was created artificially, perhaps by an outer space civilization or a passing starship. Further searches for this signal given no results, and this gave rise to many theories and arguments as to what it really was. It could have been a signal from Earth that reflected off a satellite flying through the sky, or it could have been the traces of a comet a few light years away. 
but let's assume it was a civilization from outer space, one of those 36 that probably exist. Now we need to make contact with them. So we throw our luggage into a rocket and head out in the direction of our suspected planet. Our rockets can fly at 17,600 miles per hour. That means a rocket could cross the entire United States in just eight minutes. But even if an advanced civilization lived near our closest star, Proxima Centauri, it would take us about 73,000 years to get there. Even at the speed of light, it would take 4.2 years. So we need to solve the problem of space travel. Our scientists plan to reach about a quarter of the speed of light with a laser. A powerful laser beam from Earth will push a microscopic probe in the right direction. This probe could reach our destination in about 17 years. And in another four years, when the signal from it reaches Earth, we'll know if there's an advanced civilization. Another possibility for faster than light travel is the warp bubble spacecraft. The spacecraft would have to compress space in front of it and stretch it behind its tail. Then we'll be able to reach any point in the universe in literally a few seconds. But such travel remains a fantasy for us. Perhaps we can get to different corners of the universe through wormholes. They're shortcuts similar to tunnels, but there's one problem. These wormholes might be inside black holes. They're the most mysterious objects in the universe. They're so heavy that even light can't escape their trap. Our spaceships wouldn't stand the tension either. There's also a theory that Earth is unique because it was born under completely accidental circumstances. Four and a half billion years ago, our planet was a block of lava that began to cool and solidify, but its tranquility was broken by an asteroid the size of an entire planet flying by. The collision occurred at such an angle that the Earth was not completely destroyed, but part of the asteroid remained in our orbit. A heavy rock near our planet stabilized Earth's rotation, and the gravitational interaction with the giant debris caused our core to heat up. In addition, the asteroid brought a lot of water to Earth. Such a collision is extremely unlikely. It's like winning the lottery, many times in a row. But so far, we have no reason to believe life in outer space exists. Just as we have no reason to believe that there's no advanced civilizations in the universe, except for ours. Weird, unusual sounds out of nowhere are spreading all over our galaxy, constantly repeating, and it's something we've never heard before. Scientists discovered it in 2020, and it was nothing like any of the other energy signatures they ever studied. Powerful and bright radio signals occurring from time to time, mysteriously disappearing within a day. It doesn't fit the profile of any space body we know. The signal is a bit irritating, and it disappears without a schedule. When scientists tried to match the signal with some other telescopes, it was gone. Low-mass stars sometimes flare up with radio energy, but not here, since they mostly have X-ray counterparts. Very dense collapsed stars, like pulsars and magnetars, are also not a choice. The closest solution they got is a mysterious class of objects we know as the Galactic Center Radio Source, GCRT. It's a radio source that brightens and rapidly glows. It decays near the center of our galaxy and could help us unravel the mysteries of the universe. If you had a flying car that could go up at a speed of 60 miles per hour, you'd only need one hour to get into space. The moon is a little bit farther, 250,000 miles, which is about 10 times the circumference of our planet. That means a moon trip would be like taking a tour around the globe and doing it 10 times straight, which would take less than six months. A trip to Pluto would take over 800 years. Proxima b is the closest Earth-like neighbor we have. It's a small rocky world that orbits the closest stellar neighbor of our Sun. It orbits the star's habitable zone, an area that's far enough from any star to have moderate conditions, not too cold and not too hot for liquid water to at least hypothetically exist. If you tried to travel to Proxima b at a speed of 25,000 miles per hour, which is the speed of the Apollo moon rockets, it would take you over 112,000 years to get there. You might not be able to breathe there. No one knows if Proxima b has an atmosphere. Humans explore the universe all the time, but we can only see around 5% of the matter up there. And Albert Einstein was the first one that realized the empty space is not really nothing. The rest we can't see is actually made up of invisible matter, 
also known as dark matter. It's about 27%. Combined with something called dark energy, which is 68%. If you try to pour water into space, of course, outside of a spacecraft, it would immediately boil away or vaporize. That's because there's no air or air pressure in space. As air pressure lowers, the temperature you'd usually need to boil water at also gets lower. Keeping that in mind, water boils way faster on a mountaintop than, for example, at sea level. There's no air pressure in space, so water could boil at a very low temperature. Scientists believe that there are at least a couple of billion galaxies out there. We don't know the real number, and probably never will, but they tried to calculate it by counting how many galaxies we can see in a pretty small and restricted area of the sky. It may seem as if the universe was filled with stars and a couple of planets here and there, but our home galaxy has at least 100 billion planets. If you fill a balloon with helium and release it, you'll notice it floats very high. It'll go up into the atmosphere, but it won't go into outer space. The higher you go, the thinner the air in our atmosphere gets. Your balloon will rise up until the point where the atmosphere surrounding it has the same weight as the helium inside it. That will happen at approximately a height of 20 miles above the surface. So this is as far as a helium balloon can rise. We don't really know how big the universe is. We can't see its edges, nor do we know if it even has an edge. We use technology to see out to a distance of around 14 billion light years from our planet. This means we can see around 28 billion light years in diameter across, starting with the outermost layer of our atmosphere that ends at around 600 miles above our planet's surface. Although the size of the universe is constantly changing and gets bigger through time. Mercury is closest to the sun, so most people think it's the hottest planet too. Still, Venus is the hottest planet. It's the second planet away from our central star, around 30 million miles farther from the Sun compared to Mercury. Mercury doesn't have an atmosphere, which is like some sort of a warming blanket that helps maintain the heat coming from the Sun. Venus has an unexpectedly thick atmosphere, around 100 times thicker than the one we have. Its atmosphere doesn't let the heat out, it just keeps it and constantly makes Venus hotter and hotter. Also, it mostly consists of carbon dioxide that freely lets solar energy in. But it's less transparent to lose long wavelength radiations that the warm heated surface emits. The average temperature there is around 875 degrees Fahrenheit, which is hot enough to melt tin. The maximum temperature on its neighbor, Mercury, is 800 degrees Fahrenheit. In maybe two or more billion years, it will be way too hot for life to exist on our precious planet. As the hundreds of millions of years go by, our sun will keep getting hotter and brighter. Eventually, temperatures will be so high, our beautiful oceans will be wiped away. Since they produce 70% of the oxygen we need to survive, there will be no life without them. All of this means that our planet will simply become a vast desert something like Mars is today. Pluto, a very distant used-to-be planet, now dwarf planet, is actually smaller in diameter than the entire US. The biggest distance there, from Maine to Northern California, is approximately 2,900 miles, while Pluto is only 1,473 miles across. Pluto is very far, but the edge of our solar system is 1,000 times farther away than this dwarf planet. But astronomers found many space objects orbiting our Sun way farther than Pluto, such as Kuiper Belt objects and trans-Neptunian objects. There's also an Oort comet cloud that goes half a light year from Pluto, also 1,000 times farther. A neutron star is really heavy. Just a teaspoon filled with it would weigh 6 billion tons. Neutron stars are something that remain from huge stars that have run out of fuel. The fading star explodes, and its core falls apart, but, due to gravity, it forms an extremely dense neutron star. These stars typically have a mass of up to three suns, but the radius there is around six miles, because this is one of the densest things in our universe, at least that we know about. The universe has a color, and it averages to be some kind of beige, or as they call it, 
cosmic latte. It also has its own smell that reminds you of seared steak or hot metal. At least, that's something astronauts floating in space have said. If you want to build a spacesuit, get ready to work really hard. It takes 5,000 hours to make it and will cost you a million dollars. A really good one will have 11 layers of material and weighs about 110 pounds. And it needs to be comfortable. You'll need more space in there because you grow up to 2 inches when in space. When you're floating around in space, Earth's gravity doesn't have any impact on you. That's why the vertebrae in your spine might expand and relax a little bit, which means you'll be maybe 3% taller. For 6 feet, it's about 2 extra inches. Oh, don't worry, it's not permanent. As soon as you go down to Earth, you'll shrink back down to your normal size within a couple of months. Space isn't the best option if you want to have a conversation with your friend. Because up there, sound doesn't travel at all. Molecules there are so far apart that sound vibrations can't reach them, which automatically means they can't vibrate, so we can't hear them. Movies are not accurate with this. No one could hear you screaming in space, too. We kind of live inside our sun. The sun is not just that big hot ball of light located 93 million miles away from us. Its outer atmosphere is way bigger. It extends far beyond the surface we can see. Our planet's orbit goes through its tenuous atmosphere. The evidence is when gusts of the solar wind generate the southern and northern lights. That means, in some way, we live inside the sun. Not just us, other planets too, including distant Neptune. The heliosphere, which is what we call the outer solar atmosphere, extends to about 10 billion miles. Thousands of strange spaceships sneak into Earth's airspace. They descend to our planet and fly through cities, plunging people into complete chaos. Suddenly, the door of the largest ship opens, and a strange creature comes out. It tries to copy our language and says they had come from a distant star Proxima Centauri. Something like this might happen because scientists have recently picked up a strange radio signal off that star. Proxima Centauri is the closest star to our solar system. It's only 4.2 light years away. That means a beam of light that starts from this star reaches Earth in 4.2 years. That's also 270,000 distances from Earth to the Sun. The star Proxima Centauri itself is too pale for us to see with the unaided eye in the night sky. But its system hides a little secret. Let's fly there and take a closer look. So here's this red dwarf. It's seven times smaller than our Sun and eight times lighter. Proxima Centauri is 1.5 times bigger than Jupiter and almost 150 times heavier. But what we're looking for is a little further away. This is Proxima Centauri b, a planet similar to Earth. It's only 10% larger than Earth and is in the habitable zone of the star. It's the perfect distance, not too far away and not too close. So the temperature isn't too high or low there either. Water, if it exists on that planet, can be in a liquid state. And so, life can survive and evolve there. Maybe it's developed enough to send us the signal that we had received. A radio signal is basically waves. They have a certain frequency and length, and we can always tell an artificial signal from a naturally generated one. The signal that we picked up from Proxima Centauri B had a frequency of 982 megahertz. The regular radio we listen to in the kitchen or in the car picks up signals around 100 megahertz. That's why scientists have concluded that the signal was created artificially. Such signals could have a way of communication between the developed worlds. If this is really a message from an outer space civilian, we should be able to decode it. For this, any civilization must use the simplest method of encryption. For example, Earth has already sent a radio signal into space. It was the Arecibo message. This message consists of 1,679 digits. It's a rectangle of 23 by 73 squares that has information about our civilization encoded using a binary code. At the top of the rectangle, there's a system of numbers that we use. They're marked in white. This purple thing is the key to read the next part of the message. The atomic numbers of the elements like hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus are encoded in this key. These are the key elements that can start life. If those who receive this signal can make sense of the numbers in the key, they can read the next part of the message. These green things are the building blocks of our DNA chain. 
And right at the bottom here is the DNA chain itself. The white rectangle indicates the number of pairs of these building blocks, and the blue spirals show the shape of a DNA chain. And then we see the human silhouette itself. The white and blue object to its left is a coded number of our average height. The human itself is drawn here at the ends of the DNA strand so that the outer space civilization can understand what we look like. And the white rectangle to the right of the human sketch is the number of Earth's population at the time of the message. That's 4.2 billion as of 1974, almost half the number we have now. The next part is a drawing of our solar system. The big yellow square is the Sun. Then come all the planets in our solar system, including Pluto. Earth is shifted up a bit here, so that outer space civilization can understand where this message is coming from. In the last drawing is the observatory from which this message had been sent into space. This signal is now on its way to the M13 star cluster 25,000 light years away from Earth, so it won't get there for another 25,000 years. And we'll need another 25 to get a response if there is really someone on the other side who can receive the signal. If the signal from Proxima Centauri is also a message, we'll need time to decode it. So let's fire up our super-powered computing machine and wait for the result. But this isn't the first mystery signal we've ever picked up on Earth. Scientists recorded an unusual WOW signal in 1977. They supposed it came from somewhere in the constellation of Sagittarius. The telescope was picking up the unknown signal for an impressive 72 seconds. Later, a scientist who looked at the printout of the signal concluded that the signal was artificial. He wrote, WOW! on the printout as his reaction. The following observations and studies couldn't catch this signal again. Some theories said that this signal came from a celestial spaceship flying by. It had flown away, and we could no longer detect the signal. But most likely, this signal was created on Earth. It was directed upward but reflected off an object at a high altitude. It could have been an airplane, a satellite, or space debris orbiting our planet. Then the signal was picked up by the telescope, and because it was human-made, all of its characteristics, like wavelength and frequency, could have confused scientists. In 2017, scientists recorded a flare on Proxima Centauri. The star's brightness increased by 1,000 times in just 10 seconds. Before that, there was another flare there that was weaker but lasted about two minutes. With these flares, Proxima Centauri has emitted enormous amounts of radiation. Even if there was life on the star's companion planet, these flares would have likely destroyed it. The stellar winds would have simply blown the atmosphere off the planet and made its surface lifeless. Overall, the planet Proxima Centauri b receives 60 times more high-energy radiation and 400 times more X-ray radiation than Earth. Scientists have concluded that the probability of life here is 1 to 100 million. And while we don't know yet for sure if the signal was artificial or natural, the scenario of a bunch of spaceships coming to Earth is most likely possible. Our only method for searching for outer space civilizations is using radio waves. They're like loud noise that blasts away from our planet in different directions at the speed of light. The main problem here is the gigantic distances. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, is 100,000 light years wide. Suppose there's life at the other end of it. If we send a radio signal to them, it won't reach that supposed planet for another 100,000 years. And we won't get a response for another 100,000 years. It's the same if someone once wanted to contact us. We didn't learn how to create and receive radio signals until the 19th century. If a civilization was developing at the same time as us somewhere in the Milky Way, and they invented the radio, we won't get their signal for several millennia. Plus, the radio noise from our planet is starting to fade away. We use Bluetooth, fiber optics, cable TV, so in about 100 years, we'll no longer be visible to other worlds. Or worse, what if there was an outer space civilization somewhere that was sending signals into space? The signals were reaching our planet, but we didn't yet have the technology to pick them up. The world that was sending the signal has evolved, and the signal went out. We could have caught those remnants of the radio waves that were moving through the universe, but we set up the antennas too late. There are about two trillion galaxies in the universe. Each of them contains billions and trillions of stars similar to our sun. Maybe there's a planet near one of them that looks like ours. Life could be blooming there. And this outer space civilization, just like us, is looking through telescopes in hopes to catch the radio signal from an unknown planet.